This is Blake Griffin. This is Zach Randolph. As regular citizens, I'm pretty sure they've never hated each other or even cared about each other. But here's Blake and Zach at work. Things were different on the court. These two headlined a rivalry between Western Conference contenders opposed not just in objective, but in style and reputation. Griffin was star power forward for the glitzy, high-flying LA Clippers, AKA Lob City. Randolph was star power forward for the rough, rowdy Memphis Grizzlies, AKA Grit and Grind. And their on-court battles looked like more than just basketball. This was basket beef. These two actually could have been teammates. I guess they kind of were for a moment. The 2008-2009 Los Angeles Clippers were very bad. That's despite acquiring Zach Randolph in a trade with the salary dumping Knicks early in the season. Randolph averaged over 20 points and nine rebounds a game as this LA squad's power forward, but he lost a big chunk of games to injuries, plus a smaller chunk to suspension after he fed Lou Amundsen this knuckle sandwich. The Clippers struck the right combination of losing and luck to win the 2009 NBA draft lottery. But there was an interesting wrinkle. The mostly agreed upon top prospect in that draft class was a power forward, Oklahoma sophomore Blake Griffin. Randolph had that position held down, although when you stop to consider the fact that a sweet shooting, overpowering, floor-bound slowpoke like Randolph and a nimble sky demon like Griffin both count as power forwards, you begin to question the utility of position designations. Like, Griffin had more dunks in his rookie season than Zach Randolph had in his entire career. These are not the same kind of player. But yeah, when the time came, the Clippers just put all that aside and used their top pick on Griffin. And a few days later, they solved the apparent glut and guaranteed Griffin a starting spot by trading Randolph to the Grizzlies for nothing. Well, they got Quentin Richardson, but didn't want him and immediately dumped him. Because of cold NBA financial rules, Quentin Richardson was the 2009 equivalent of nothing. Randolph's new team had also been bad. Bad enough in 09 to get the second pick, which they used to draft Hashim Thabit over some other guys. But over the next couple seasons, the Grizzlies improved and established a new identity under coach Lionel Hollins. Randolph joined Rudy Gay and rising center Marc Gasol in the front court. Mike Conley emerged as a leader at point guard, and Tony Allen arrived in 2010 to both utter and embody the Grizzlies' new motto, grit and grind. By 2011, Memphis was a playoff team defined by rough, throttling defense. They made games slow and ugly, and they loved to scrap. A perfect fit for the man they called Zebo who came into his own as a real star and relished threatening rival big men like Kendrick Perkins. Speaking of rival big men, the Clippers also grew into a playoff team, although it took a little bit longer. Griffin missed the whole 09-10 season with a knee injury. Blake's brilliant debut came the following year in which he was the rare rookie to make the all-star team. Dunk contest too. LA still wasn't very good, but they had a star. Then things escalated in an instant when the Clippers acquired Chris Paul before the 2012 season. Suddenly, Griffin and DeAndre Jordan had the league's best point guard around to toss them alley-oops. Blake gave the new Clippers their nickname the moment he found out about the trade. Are you serious? Lob City. Oh my God. Lob City. LA had marketable superstars, an elegant, high-flying offense, and by season's end, a healthy 56 wins. The Clippers' first playoff series in years would come against a team with the same record, the Grizzlies. It was Lob City versus the Grindhouse, flashy versus grimy, a stark stylistic contrast epitomized by the Griffin-Randolph matchup. Those two already had some physical regular season battles under their belt, but nothing resembling beef. In their first couple matchups, Randolph held the upper hand against the kid who replaced him, but called Griffin a monster and a tremendous player. In this first playoff matchup, Randolph wasn't quite himself, still playing back into form after missing most of the season recovering from a knee injury. In the opening minutes of the first round series, Griffin threw Randolph to the floor with a hard foul. It looked for a moment like the older, still recovering player was hurt, but then Zebo did a few push-ups to show the Memphis crowd he was ready for war. Ready or not, Randolph played kind of poorly in that game. The Clippers made a huge comeback to take game one and went on to lead the series three games to one. 
The Grizzlies grew increasingly irritable, not just about the losing, but about perceived theatrics from the Clippers, flopping and flailing to sell fouls. In Game 4, Randolph put a foul on Griffin and followed through with a little chest bump. Blake didn't respond and was described as smiling when he talked about that moment after the win. He was feeling good. But things turned. Griffin suffered a knee injury colliding with Gasol in Game 5, Paul was hurting too, and Memphis eventually tied the series 3-all. Randolph didn't want to hear a word about the injuries to the LA Stars. It's the playoffs. Everybody's hurt. Zach's knee was still hurting. No excuses. And as if to prove that, Randolph hopped on Griffin's back for a bit in Game 7. At another point, he got tangled with Blake and just f***ing smacked him in the face. Neither of those were called fouls. Playoff basketball. Despite their injuries, the Clippers held Memphis completely in check and withstood that series comeback. They won Game 7 and sent their opponents home, though Zach wouldn't leave without the last word. While the Clippers advanced, Randolph accused them of being the league's biggest floppers by far and blamed Chris Paul's negative influence. He said Griffin only started embellishing fouls when Paul arrived in L.A. So yeah, Randolph was grumpy about how that series ended, but he stayed pretty quiet throughout the offseason. Zach is a beefsman of the show-don't-tell variety, and he showed Blake how he felt in the very first game of the next season. On one end, Griffin and Randolph had some words after battling for a loose ball. On the other end, Randolph taught his younger counterpart some wrestling moves with a picture-perfect suplex. There were 52 combined fouls in this season-opening rival rematch. The matchup stayed physical, but avoided major conflict unless you count Randolph body-slamming Griffin in one of the last games of the regular season. That was a warning shot for the battle to come in the 2013 postseason, a first-round rematch between the four-seed Clippers and five-seed Grizzlies. Griffin predicted that Randolph would continue trying to frustrate him and that he'd have to get physical with Randolph without losing his cool. Zach reminded everyone he'd been hurt the prior season. He was ready to scrap. And thus began a series defined by mutual aggression. You rarely see double fouls called in the NBA, but the constant physicality between Griffin and Randolph left officials unable to determine who fouled whom. They picked up one such double foul call in LA's Game 1 victory, after which Griffin explained that grappling was simply Randolph's game and all he could do in response was even things out. Said Blake, that's the way he wants to play, let's do it. And they were back at it in Game 2. This elegant dance in the third quarter got called a double foul, the third personal for each. Randolph pretty clearly initiated that tangle, which was typical. He craved the wrestling, as evidenced by the moment in the next game where Matt Barnes hit Randolph with a hard foul and Zach responded by thanking him with a hug. Griffin made an effort not to engage Randolph in extracurriculars, though when asked if it was easy to keep his composure amid all that manhandling, he said, not really. The middle of this 2013 series followed a similar trajectory to 2012. L.A. took an early series lead, Memphis came back and tied it, then Griffin got hurt. He sat a bunch of Game 5 with a bum ankle. Memphis won that game to take a series lead, and once again Zebo got to mocking his banged-up counterpart. He was banged up too. It's the playoffs. It's a big boy game. And yet again, weakened prey only emboldened the Predator. With a big Memphis lead in Game 6 at home, Randolph fell to the floor with Griffin, got him in some sort of hold, and then maybe kinda choked the guy. The ref's ruling? Double foul, and a tech on Randolph, which would become relevant later when Randolph picked up a second technical in the closing minutes of the series-clinching Memphis victory. Blake was on the bench, but Randolph let him hear it during some free throws, then kept barking after he got ejected. The grit and grind Grizzlies fans loved it. By the way, if you're wondering what Zach said, he used the F-bomb. He threw the P-word out there. He said a bunch of stuff about Blake Griffin to his face. Stephen A. Smith gave that recap in the context of a conversation about whether Griffin was soft, a conversation Randolph himself stoked after that series. Memphis advanced to face the Oklahoma City Thunder, and Randolph told reporters that unlike the Clippers, unlike Blake, Thunder big men like Kendrick Perkins and Serge Ibaka were tough. Griffin said he was more than willing to fight, but off the court because I don't want to get suspended. And fittingly, Randolph hit Steven Adams in the face in the 2014 postseason and got suspended for the crucial Game 7 of that series against the Thunder. Memphis lost that game without Randolph, thus denying the world a second round matchup with the Clippers. We could have had a World War III, and it's a real shame we didn't. 
A regular season that included Tony Allen kicking Chris Paul in the face deserved a third straight postseason matchup. But yeah, the Clippers faced the Thunder instead, and LA coach Doc Rivers made an example of Randolph to remind Griffin to never take the bait. Griffin stuck with that, almost always walking away from hard fouls and cheap shots, even as he acknowledged the pressure from others to just turn around and punch somebody. And when Blake did finally punch somebody, it was off the court and it was very weird, and he broke his hand. Randolph, meanwhile, got old, got in some more fights, said some tough quotes, left Memphis as the sun set on the grit and grind era, and in one of his final matchups with Blake, got fucking cooked. Blake had one weird interaction with Memphis fans in 2018, but this beef is over, and we are left to reflect on what it was. Randolph says it was just him being competitive. Jeff Calkins describes it very well as the pretty boy who jumped over Kias versus the tough, in-the-mud guy who couldn't jump over a phone book but would have his way with Blake. The fouling in those playoff series was excessive. Two guys who averaged two or three fouls per game for their careers routinely put four-plus fouls on each other in the postseason. But like Calkins said, when regular fouling crossed over into beef, it was almost always Randolph doing whatever he wanted, saying what he wanted, and Griffin basically refusing to respond. Maybe that's just because these people didn't and don't hate each other. They were just perfect foils on the court. The machismo mascots, the torchbearers in one of the most fun and violent rivalries of the mid-2010s. There's something to be said for that. So much of the beef we discuss touches on real-world stuff. Friendship, romance, money. This was aggression on the floor, fueling beef on the floor. It was pure. Thanks for watching Beef History. Blake's got a decent amount of beef, but not nearly as much as his old teammate Chris Paul, so check these out. Like and subscribe.